It was tragic to me, the death of radio. Um, radio was sold down the river. It needn't have disappeared. It didn't disappear in England. It didn't disappear in France. And it needn't have disappeared in the United States. They took the, uh, they, the networks primarily, took the proceeds of radio advertising, built up their television networks, and then dumped radio as though it had simply ceased to exist. Radio could have and should have survived. And the fact that there's as much interest in it as there is now, I think is proof of that. I did a show once on Armed Forces Radio Service with John Anderson. We did a 13-week series on uh, Lewis and Clark. It was an excellently produced and directed show, very well written, historically accurate. And I've played those records for my children and other children at times. And they're fascinated. The idea that they create the scenery, they create the action. They think this is great and we don't even have to sit down and watch television. Petri Wine brings you Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. You know, the lives of Holmes and Watson were not always filled with action. They spent many a quiet evening at home in Baker Street, discussing the problems of the world over a glass of port. <laughs> you know, it seems that no wine is more expressive of friendship and hospitality than port. And I'm sure there's no port wine more enjoyable than Petri California port. Try a good glass of Petri port after dinner some evening, or any time you get together with your friends. You'll love the rich, ruby red color of that Petri port. You'll love its smoothness and full body, its remarkable and wonderful flavor, a flavor that comes straight from the heart of luscious, hand-picked grapes. Serve that Petri port alone, or serve it together with cake or cookies or with fruit. Yes, and serve it proudly. You can, because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now I'm sure our old friend Dr. Watson's expecting us. Let's tap on his study door. Come in, come in, come in. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Come over here by the fire. I was just having a cup of coffee. Would you care to join me? Thanks, that'd be nice. <laughs> It'll prevent you falling asleep during my story tonight. <laughs> There's no chance of that, Doctor. From the hints you gave us last week, it sounded like quite a story. It began in a circus in Paris, you told us? Yes, my boy, the circus. A colorful world of sawdust and spangles. A world, Mr. Bartell, that I may tell you confidentially, always held an irresistible fascination for me when I was a youngster. Me too, Doctor. In fact, when I was eight years old, I fell desperately in love with a, with a lady bareback rider, a stunning creature who wore pink silk tights with gold sequins on them. Unfortunately, my mother caught me writing her proposal of marriage, and I'm afraid that, uh, well, uh, that's another story, and one that you probably wouldn't find very interesting. <laughs> I'm sure I would, Doctor, but... I think it would be safer to stick to your Sherlock Holmes yes, story. Yes, you're probably right, my boy. Well, it was a winter in the 1890s, and Holmes and I were in Paris. On our second day there, Holmes suggested we attend that night's performance of the Cirque Royale. Needless to remark, I was delighted, Mr. Bartell. And shortly after nine o'clock that night, I found myself seated beside Holmes in a box near the ringside. It was an incredibly vivid scene, even for that city of color and light. The gay costumes of the women and the gaudy trappings of the ringmasters and clowns looked like a giant kaleidoscope under the blazing glare of the arc lamps. As we sat there, a brass band nearby blared forth some popular music of the day, and yet he didn't appear to be enjoying himself. And so I leaned across and touched his arm. Hmm. What is it, Watson? 
Well, you're very quiet, Holmes. Aren't you having a good time? A good time, I suppose. Well, chap, I was just wondering where Mr. Edwards is. Mr. Edwards? Who, who's he? An extremely distinguished client who was to meet us in this box at nine o'clock. Ah, client. Oh, this little excursion was on business. After all, yes, I might have known it. No, my old fellow. In your case, I think you'll be able to combine quite a little pleasure with the business. Well, can't you be a little more explicit, Holmes? Shh. Here comes the ringmaster. La grande vedette du cirque, Mademoiselle Giselle Girondet, équestrienne incomparable. Giselle Girondet, yes, I've heard of her. She's a bareback rider, isn't she? Artist in France, old fellow. She also has quite a reputation as a femme fatale. Three duels have been fought over her. A young English officer in the Grenadier Guards committed suicide last year because of her. And a famous French banker is at present languishing in prison because her extravagances drove him to appropriate funds that did not belong to him. Yes, Watson, she's an extremely colourful personality. You know, Holmes, it's a funny thing. When I was eight years old, I fell violently in love with a lady bareback rider. She wore pink silk tights with golden sequins on them, but uh, unfortunately... Here she is, old fellow. Here she is. Look at the way she's jumping from the back of one horse to the other. Sheer poetry of motion. The lady appeals to you, Watson. By George, yes, indeed she does. In fact, Holmes, I don't mind telling you that if I weren't a married man and a yeah, poor man... Yeah, you'd like man... to court the lady, eh? Uh, yes, I, I should Excellent, indeed. Excellent, old fellow. Excellent. That's the very reason for our attendance at the well, What in heaven's name are you talking about, Holmes? Ah, there you are. Good evening, Mr. Edwards. Holmes, my dear fellow, how are you? I haven't seen you since... Uh... Since that little affair at Windsor Castle, when Mother... Uh, excuse me, sir. I am Mr. Mycroft, and this is my friend, uh, Sir William Nigel. Sir William Nigel? Oh, of course, of course. And I am Mr. Edwards. We must uh, respect each other's incognitos, eh? How do you do, Sir William? Uh, well, I'm extremely honoured to meet you, Your, your Royal... Uh, 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 Mr. Edwards. How do you like Giselle? Isn't she a stunning creature? Yes, indeed she is, sir. The four of us to have supper together after the performance tonight, I understand, Mr. Edwards. Well, unfortunately, I can't be there, Mycroft. There's some stupid affair at the embassy which I have to attend. We must postpone the dinner until tomorrow night. Oh, very well, sir. Uh, come over to my hotel a little early and we can discuss the whole business. Personally, I think a lot of fuss is being made about nothing. Now, if you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I must go back and see Giselle for a moment and tell her that I can't keep our appointment for tonight. I'll see you tomorrow, Mycroft. Good night, sir, will you? Oh, good night. Good night, uh, good night sir. And now, for your pleasure, the frères Salini, the Jongleurs International. Holmes, what's all this mystery? That wasn't Mr. Edwards, it was the Prince of... Shh, Watson, please. Discretion, old fellow. Mr. Edwards, as you know, is extremely democratic. Too much so, possibly, when one considers his position and responsibilities. He's become quite seriously involved with Mademoiselle Giselle, the lady bareback rider who has just left the ring. Oh, so that's it. The Foreign Office, quite naturally, I suppose, is deeply concerned over the matter. And I've been entrusted with the delicate mission of protecting Mr. Edwards. Oh, does Giselle Gironde know that his true identity, do you suppose? That's the first thing that we have to find out. It's possible that she is simply captivated by having a rich Englishman at her feet. If on on the other hand, uh, she knows who Mr. Edwards is, then we may be in for a great deal of trouble. Yes, but how are you going to find that out? By tempting her with a richer Englishman, and one with a title. That, my dear fellow, is why you are Sir William Nigel. You mean that uh, Your I... job, old what? fellow, is to do your utmost to steal Giselle Gironde from Mr. Edwards. But, uh, well, I, I don't even know the girl. We shall remedy that defect in a few minutes. As soon as the performance is over, my dear chap, I shall take you to her dressing room and arrange an introduction. I must say, Holmes, the backstage life at a circus is even more colourful than in the ring. What makes <laughs> you say that, old fellow? Well, I just saw Pinhead having tea with a, a bearded lady while a sword swallower was standing behind him practising his act. Oh, hello. 
See that man standing talking to the girl in tights? Yeah, attractive, isn't she? Uh, the gentleman is Inspector Bernay of the French police, an old friend and a distant relative of mine. Bernay! How are you? Ah, well, <clears throat> mon cher ami, comment ça no, 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 va? No, 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 Bernay, please. On this occasion, my name is Mycroft, if you don't mind, and this is my friend, Sir William Nigel. How do you do, Inspector? Enchanté, Sir William. Uh, permit me to introduce Mademoiselle Yvette Marat. How you do? How do you do, madame? How do you do? Uh, uh, what brings you behind the scenes at the circus, may I ask, Monsieur Mycroft? Uh, my friend Sir William is most anxious to make the acquaintance of Mademoiselle Gironde. But of course, every man wishes to meet Giselle Gironde. Why not ask Bernay? He will present you to her. Ha! In no other way. Oh, now, Yvette, chérie, do not begin that all over again. You are in love with her. You have always been in love with her. I, I, I wish you were dead. Sometimes I... Sometimes I think I could kill her myself! Oh, upon my soul, Inspector, she's a fiery little thing, isn't she? Ah, ça c'est vrai, ça, Sir William. <laughs> Many times I've told her that Giselle Gironde would never waste her time with a simple police inspector. Uh, uh, she prefers a wealthy foreigner. But Yvette ne comprend pas. She does not understand and she does not believe. Mademoiselle Marat was dressed in tights, Bernay. And uh, what does she do in the circus? Uh, she walks the tightrope. Oh, She's yes, a queen of the high wire. Mm -hmm. A charming and a talented girl, but a most, most, most jealous one. Uh, Bernay, my distinguished friend Sir William Nigel is most anxious to meet Giselle Gironde. Uh, will you introduce him? I should prefer not to appear on the matter at this stage. Oh, mais certainement. I, I will take you to her dressing room. Uh, please come with me, Sir William. Yeah, right. I I'll see you later, Holmes. I'll be waiting for you, old chap. Good luck. Hey, you're a lucky man, Sir William. Giselle has quite a penchant for the Englishmen. And when they are rich and have a title, I am sure she finds them irresistible. You really think so? Oh, but of course. Ah, quel dommage that I'm only a poor policeman. Ah, hey, here we are. Entrez. Giselle Monchou, permit me to present to you Sir William Nigel. He's a great admirer of yours. Yes, indeed, madam. Ah, Sir William Nigel. Come and sit here beside me, Sir William. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, shall leave you. Au revoir. Uh, sit closer. There. That is much more cozy, no? Oh, it's very nice of you to see me, Mademoiselle Gironde. Oh, don't <laughs> be so formal, my Englishman. You may call me Giselle, and I shall call you... Let me see, I shall call you Sir William Nigel. Willie, I shall call you Willie. You do not mind? <laughs> Mine, I, I think it's very delightful. Quite delightful, my dear. I was hoping perhaps that you'd care to have a little, little supper with me tonight, Giselle. <laughs> uh, so what about some, some oysters, a cold pheasant, and a bottle or two of Pomery and Green 072? Don't you get to taste rather well, don't you think? <laughs> oh, Willie, I can see you are a perfect host. Oh, toast. I don't know about One that. One moment, I get my clock. Uh, well, you, you know, Giselle, it, it, it's a funny thing. What is a funny thing, Willie? When I was eight years old, I fell violently in love with a, a lady bareback rider at a circus. History seems to be repeating its... Here. Help your Alfieri. Do you no longer knock when you come to my door? Who is this man? My name is Nigel, Sir William Nigel, my good man. And who may you be? I am Alfio Alfieri. I am Alfio Alfieri. And what is he? Huh. A trainer of wild animals. An imbecile. What You must not speak to Alfio in that way. You belong to me. Send this stupid Englishman away. I found it impudent. Grossier. Belong to you. She said belong to no one. Do I have to take my whip uh, to put you? Put it on that way. Put it down, you scoundrel. <coughs> Next time it will be your face, can You Ramia. infernal blackguard. Raising your hand against the woman. Shocking. Bravo. Monsieur Willie has knocked him down. Uh, he certainly deserved it. Oui. And... You, in turn, deserve something, Willie. Oh, what was that? Come close, Willie, and I give it to you. A little kiss. Oh, kiss? <laughs> Thanks awfully. <laughs> so strong, so resolute, so brave. Oh, it was nothing, my dear Giselle, nothing at all. Here, more champagne, Gus, more champagne. Oh, Willie! Giselle? Oui, Monsieur Edwards? I have a box for the opera tomorrow night. I was hoping that perhaps... Oh, I'm sorry, Monsieur, but my time is occupied. I am showing the delights of moment to mon cher Willie. Really. 
Mademoiselle est mieux le collier de perles à 5 rangs ou celui à 3 rangs? He says, which do I prefer? The five string color pearls or the three string color pearls? What does my really think? So that you can't hang too many pearls on a pretty neck like yours. I'll take the five string collar, my good fellow. <laughs> You're doing splendidly, Watson, splendidly. Yes, but Holmes, I felt such a blasted fool handing that jeweler fellow a check signed by Sir William Nigel. Are you quite sure that it'll oh, be honored? Oh, don't worry, old fellow. Remember who our client is. Money is the least important concern in this matter. On with the masquerade, old fellow. On with the masquerade. More champagne, Gussel. <laughs> Such a headstrong boy. <laughs> More champagne. <laughs> Sit down, you dear little thing. <laughs> Good evening, Vernet. Has Mademoiselle Girondet come into the evening performance yet? Yes, Monsieur Holmes. I escorted her to her dressing room an half an hour ago. Uh, Monsieur Edwards is in there with her now. At last, it seems, she has use for a poor policeman. Last night, she found a threatening letter on her makeup table. Since then, she has been most grateful for my company. A threatening letter, eh? Any idea who might have sent it? Oh, yes, of course. I'm afraid I have, Monsieur Holmes. Uh, I told her to pay no attention. Uh, by the perfume of the notepaper, I recognized the sender. A jealous tightrope walker called Yvette Marat. Oh. <laughs> Poor Yvette. She would make a very inferior criminal, I'm afraid. Still, Giselle asked me to stay outside her dressing room till the performance starts. Uh, uh, you wish to see her? Uh, yes. I... Oh, good evening, Mr. Edwards. Evening, Mycroft. Evening, Inspector Verne. Uh, come on, serve up, Mr. Edwards. Look here, Mycroft. I think this little game's gone far enough. Giselle has just refused another invitation of mine. Now, I know who Sir William Nigel is, and I swear I'll tell her. Uh, don't you think, sir, that the lady is hardly worth bothering about? Surely this whole incident with Sir William proves that she's a scheming little adventuress. A fictitious title and an apparently bottomless purse have shown her up in her true colours. <laughs> I could have told you the same thing without such an experiment, my friend. Well, I suppose you're right, Mycroft. I've been a fool. An idiot who lets a pretty ankle turn his head. A conceited dolt. <laughs> Let us just say, monsieur, that you have been a man. Uh, good evening, sir. Oh, good hello, evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, just going back to see Giselle for a moment, I brought us these flowers for her. Oh, I'll be back in a jiffy. Uh, just a minute, Watson. I, uh, I hate to dampen your ardor, old chap, but uh, the masquerade is ended. Ended? What, what do you mean it's ended? It is no ended. longer necessary for you to impersonate Sir William Nigel or to pay court to Giselle. Oh, oh, really? Oh, 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 really? Really? Well, that's a, that's a great relief, sir. Great relief. I've hated the whole business. Oh, yes, yes, I'm sure you have. Uh, we um, appreciate the sacrifices that you've made, don't we, Sir Edward? Yes, yes, indeed. Well, I must go back and see her once more, though. We had a rendezvous for tonight, and I must cancel it. A gentleman thing to do, you know. Um, I, I won't be a minute. <laughs> Never have I seen a man more downcast. Obviously, with him, my dear Holmes, business was a pleasure. Alfieri! Where are you going? That Englishman. I just saw him go into Giselle's room. To whom are you referring? That man that called himself Sir William Nigel. Well. Two days ago he struck me. I have to settle with him. No man may strike Alfieri. Do not cause any more trouble, Alfieri. From what I've been told, you thoroughly deserved what happened yeah. to you. Here he come now. You English, you! Alfieri challenge you to a duel. Holmes! Holmes! What's no chap? What is it? You're as white as a ghost. It's... it's Giselle. What's wrong with her? She's dead. She's lying there in her dressing room. Strangled. Strangled. And only half an hour ago I spoke with her myself. Since then I've been standing in this corridor, guarding her door at her own request. Only two men have entered Giselle's dressing room since then. You, Monsieur Edwards, and you, Sir William Nigel. What are you suggesting, Vernet? I am suggesting nothing. I am stating that these two gentlemen are under arrest for suspicion of murder. Dr. Watson's unusual story will continue in just a few seconds. Time I'd like to take to remind you that one wine that seems to be the outstanding favorite among the ladies is Petri California Muscatel. That's probably because, like a beautiful woman, 
Petri Muscatel is subtle and intriguing. Petri Muscatel is the color of burnished gold. And its flavor, well, it's the flavor of big, plump Muscat grapes, picked by hand, carefully and tenderly, when they're just full of wonderful, delicious juice. If you want to show that you really know the wine that women prefer, serve Petri Muscatel. Serve it after dinner or later in the evening. It's wonderful. And why shouldn't it be? It's a Petri wine. Well, Dr. Watson, so you and the mysterious uh, Mr. Edwards got yourselves arrested on suspicion of murder, huh? Yes, Mr. Bartell. Holmes did everything in his part to persuade Inspector Vernet to release us, but it was useless. And so, while Mr. Edwards and myself were languishing in detention cells, the local Sûreté, Holmes, and the French inspector were examining the dressing room of the dead woman. I'm, in sh I'm sure, Inspector Vernet, that... Uh... Being as keen a detective as you are, you must suspect the true identity of Mr. Edwards. Of course, Monsieur Holmes. But that is the danger of incognitos. If he chooses to assume the identity of plain Monsieur Edwards, then he must run the risks of plain Monsieur Edwards. And you are convinced that either he or my friend strangled Mademoiselle Gironde? It is obvious. Then I'll have to prove to you that they didn't. Let me examine the body again. No. If she had been strangled by either of my friends, why would her body be lying here under the window? as far away from the door by which they left this room as possible. That proves nothing. No, but it's odd. Giselle was a strong girl. Uh, there might easily have been a struggle. Uh, perhaps she tried to get away through the window. And yet there are no marks of violence on her throat. Just this piece of very fine cord that did its deadly work so cleanly. <laughs> Cut with a knife. Uh, uh, please do not remove the cord, Monsieur Holmes. The body has not yet been photographed. Pierre Vernet, you're making it very hard for me, aren't you? Uh, you notice, of course, that the window is open. Yes, but we have examined the snow outside. There were no footprints within three yards of the window. The murderer must have entered by the door that I was watching. Yes, it would be hard, even for a professional acrobat to jump in. An acrobat? Bernay, your young friend, Mademoiselle Yvette Marat, is a tightrope walker. Yvette, but... Yes, she certainly had a motive. She'd even sent a threatening letter. I heard her express hatred and jealousy for this dead woman. It's conceivable that she could enter a room by a window without leaving footprints in the snow. Where was she at the time of the murder? I do not know. I was waiting for her in the corridor. And I suggest that we investigate her alibi at once. And after that, Inspector, I must pay a visit to the Sûreté. I don't want my friends to think that I've deserted them. Excuse me, sir. Yes, Holmes. I'm afraid it looks rather black. As I was telling you, Yvette Marat, the tightrope walker, was able to establish a completely satisfactory alibi. Vernet still suspects you or Dr. Watson. Well, that's ridiculous. May I ask you a very straightforward question, sir? Of course. I can well understand that if you had gone into the dressing room and found the woman already murdered, you might easily be tempted to conceal the fact, to avoid a scandal involving your person. Will you swear to me, sir, on your true identity? That Giselle was alive when you left her. She was, Holmes. I swear it. Thank you, sir. That's all I wanted to know. Holmes, I'm glad to see you. You know, I've been thinking. All this depends on Vernet's evidence. But supposing he was the murderer. He told us that Giselle had turned him down, you know. I thought of that, but Mr. Edwards swears that Giselle was alive when he left the room. And yet that means that Mr. Edwards... Oh, no, 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 it's unthinkable. Holmes, you're not suggesting... Holmes, if I thought that that were possible, I'd confess to the murder myself. My life wouldn't matter if, if it had saved a scandal like that. Great Scott, it'd, it'd shatter the empire. Dear old Watson, you shall not sacrifice yourself. You're as valuable a British institution as the lion himself. No, my dear fellow. We shall never sacrifice you, not while my mind is still capable of... My mind? That's it. Thank you, Watson. You've given me the answer. Holmes, what are you burbling be about Be patient, now? old fellow. In half an hour, you'll be out of this cell and the real murderer will be in it. Questions, questions. Why must Alfieri answer so many questions? Because he will not yet tell the truth. You murdered Giselle Gironde. How many times I have to tell you I did not kill her? Why should I want to arm her? Because you were jealous. 
Because she humiliated and tormented you. But I was not in her dressing room. I've already proved that fact. Am I a magician that I can kill somebody without entering a room? Alfieri, I know how you killed Giselle Gironde without its necessitating your entering this room. Uh, and you're a smart man. Please, to tell me. I don't need to tell you. With the aid of Vernet, I'll show you. Open the window, Alfieri. Uh, what game is this? Very well, then. I'll open the window myself. Put your head out. Come on. So. Uh, who do you see? Inspector Vernet, standing three yards away, where you stood, and he's got your long training whip. No, no! Don't move! Stand there, the inspector hasn't your skill with a whip, but he wants to try a little experiment. No, leave him alone! All right, Vernet, I'm holding him! Mr. Edwards, I mean, I mean, well, sir, this is a pleasant change from a prison cell, isn't it? It certainly is. <laughs> Holmes, I can't tell you how grateful I am. I still don't quite understand how you did it. Watson, in uh, rather a roundabout way, was responsible for giving me the clue. Oh, how was that, Holmes? Well, on more than one occasion, old chap, I've had cause to deploy a rather florid style of writing. Tonight, I was very thankful for it. Uh, when I began to speak of the capabilities of my mind, uh, suddenly I remembered a phrase of yours in which you referred to uh, its whip-like rapidity and accuracy. That, of course, made me think of Alfieri, the animal trainer. Exactly how did he kill the poor girl? Uh, well, sir, he stood outside the window, uh, far enough away to leave no incriminating footprints, called to Giselle, probably persuaded her to lean out, then snapped the whip around her neck, pulling it tight and strangling her. And then I suppose he cut the cord and let the body fall back into the room. Precisely, old fellow. We found a whipstock among his tackle, a whipstock from which the lash had been cut. The stub of lash left matched the cord around the dead girl's throat. Amazing business. And I don't mind telling you, fellas, I'm very thankful to be through with it. Yes, so am I, sir. In fact, I wouldn't be at all surprised if this whole instant cures me of my love of circuses. Oh, I didn't know you had a predilection in that direction, Watson. Oh, oh, oh yes, sir. Yes, if you don't mind my saying so. Uh, uh, when he was eight years old, he fell in love with a lady bareback rider. <laughs> didn't you, Watson? <laughs> Indeed. What happened? Well, sir, I, I don't remember her name, but she wore pink silk tights with golden sequins on them. And I wrote her a rather hot-headed letter. Unfortunately, my mother... Well, Doctor, that was one of the most unusual stories you've ever told. And, and I might say you played a very prominent part in that case yourself. Oh, I suppose I did it. That, Mr. Bartell. Giselle was a beautiful girl. Beautiful. Boy, I sure love that nickname she gave you. Wheelie. Yes, I thought it was rather nice myself. Well, that is, uh, I, I, I mean... I, uh... <laughs> Don't get embarrassed over a nickname, Doctor. You should hear the nickname I had. Well, when I went to school, all the girls called me Bottles. Bottles? Oh, oh I see, from Bartell. Bartell? Bartell. Oh, me. <laughs> Some nickname, like a prophecy. What do you mean? Well, they called me Bottles, and now that's what I like to talk about most. Bottles. Bottles of Petri wine. Oh, I should have known. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'd like to talk about Petri wine because, as far as I'm concerned, it's the swellest wine that ever poured from a bottle. That's because the Petri family really knows how to make good wine. Well, they ought to. They've been making good wine ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s. And since the Petri family has always personally owned and operated their business, they've been able to keep that fine art of winemaking right in the family, handing it on down from father to son, from father to son, from generation to generation. So it's no wonder whenever you want a good wine, you want a Petri wine, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes story are you going to tell us about next well, week? Well, now, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you of a strange adventure that Holmes and I had in the swampy Fenlands of Norfolk. Concerns a gypsy encampment, a child that vanished, and a horrible death in the murky depths of a fearsome quagmire. <laughs>
Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Three Students. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The two episodes you've just heard, The Telltale Pigeon Feathers and The Indiscretion of Mr. Edwards, a part of the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes starring Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce, and are a 1989 copyrighted production of 221A Baker Street Associates. The Sherlock Holmes stories and the characters of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. John H. Watson were created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and are used with the kind permission of Dame Jean Conan Doyle. This is Harry Bartell. I want to thank you for letting me share those wonderful times on Dramatic Radio. I'll be back soon on another cassette where I'll present Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson in The Adventure of Thor Bridge and The Double Zero. Thank you for listening. <laughs>